Hello. In today's lecture, we're going to be looking at numerical methods and how we can use these methods computationally to approximate derivatives of complex functions. Um, sorry, not, not complex functions, um, as in real and imaginary, uh, complicated functions, um, I should rather say, um, and definite integrals. Okay, so let's begin with approximating um, the derivative. Okay, so this first method is called finite difference. Finite difference and is a way of approximating the differential that we use in derivatives. So the dy by dx, we replace with delta y over delta x, where delta y and delta x are both finite differences um, in those variables. Okay, so in the Newtonian way of writing the derivative, we have f prime of x is equal to the limit as h goes to zero, f of x plus h minus f of x over x plus h minus x, but that's just going to be h. Okay, so this was the uh, Newton way of doing the derivative by taking this limit. Now, if we don't take the limit, then this only becomes an approximation. So we write f prime of x is approximately f of x plus h minus f of x over h, where h is some small value. So we can say h is very, very small. Okay, so very, very small, but still finite. Okay, we're not going into this infinitesimal form uh, where we have the df bar dh, so the df, sorry, df by dx over here. Uh, we're not looking at the infinitesimal limits. We have a finite value there. Yeah, and this is how we define the numerical uh, differentiation for f. Yeah, we approximate it like this. Okay, so we're going to be doing this computationally. So um, we can write this process using a path and function. Yeah. So let's say we have this function f that we define. So we can say def f of x, with the colon. Yeah. And let's say it's sine's sine of x squared e to the minus x, for example. So we can return, sorry. NP dot sign because we're using the numpy library x times x for x squared times NP dot x for the exponential of minus x. Yeah, so we can write it um, like that. So then this represents f of x is equal to sine of x squared e to the minus x. Okay, so we've just made a computational form of that function. Now, if we want to find the derivative or f prime, we can also define that as another function. So we can say def f prime or f derivative, the, the naming is, is up to you at a point x. Okay, so we need this finite, very small h over here. So we can define h to be something very, very small, something like that. So you can go even smaller than that, but uh, just to illustrate the idea, we can, we can write that. So now we just need to implement this difference and quotient here, but that's pretty easy to do. So we can just return. We need f of x plus h, but we've already defined the function f. So we can say f of x plus h, we know what those two variables are, minus f of x, and then we can divide by h. Yeah, and if we return this, this function will provide the derivative, uh, an approximation to the derivative at x. So this function 
will approximate the derivative of f at the given x. Yeah, and as we make h smaller and smaller, this will get closer and closer to the exact derivative. In other words, closer to this limit um, above here. Okay, so that is the first derivative. Now we can repeat this procedure to find higher order derivatives. So we can do a second order finite difference. Okay, so the first order difference, that was for first derivatives. Second order difference, that's for second derivatives. So second order finite difference. Okay, so there are a few ways of writing this, okay, just based on um, how you want to implement it. Okay, and uh, we'll see the different variations now. So the first variation is called second order central difference. Okay, so this is f double prime of x is equal to, and now we take the two derivatives, take their difference, um, and then divide it by the difference. Okay, uh, much like we did here, where we took the difference in the function, divided by h for the second derivative, we take the difference in the derivatives and divide by h. Okay, in other words, differentiating the derivative. So this can be written as f of x plus h. So we take a, a positive step in the x direction, minus f of x, over h, so that is the first derivative that we have, minus, and then we need to take the derivative of the function a little bit away from where we are. Okay, so we can write it as f of x minus f of x minus h, all over h, and then again divided by h. So we see that for the first term, x plus h, we took a step forward, f of x plus h, so we're moving forward in the x direction. So we get the derivative there. Then the next term, we're taking a step backwards, okay, because it's f of x minus h. So we're taking a step backwards, taking a difference between those two derivatives, and then we say that that is our second derivative. Yeah, and we see why it's called central, because the derivative at a given point here requires that we take a step forward and we take a step backwards, and then that gives us the derivative at that middle point. Yeah, it's like an averaging between those two. Yeah, so that's why we call it the central difference. Uh, this can be simplified to f of x plus h minus 2f of x plus f of x minus h all over h squared. Okay, so that's the first variation. Okay, so we would use this variation if we could take a step forward and a step back. We will see later in the applications of this that that is not always possible. Okay, so sometimes you can't take a step back for some reason, uh, then this would not be used. Yeah, if you can't take the step back and you can only take a step forward, then we use the second order forward difference. So that's the second variation. So second order forward difference. Yeah. So again, this approximates the second order derivative. And again, we need to take the difference between two derivatives, yeah, then divided by the, the step size between them, and then that, that approximates it. But for the forward difference, instead of taking a step forward and a step back, we take one step forward 
And then we take another step forward. So we take two steps forward. Okay, so this is going to be f of x plus 2h. So two steps forward minus f of x. Uh, sorry, minus f of x plus h over h minus, and now we take just one step forward, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So that's the derivative two steps ahead and the derivative one step ahead. Again, divide all by h, and then we can simplify this to f of x plus 2h minus 2f of x plus h plus f of x. And again, all divided by h squared. Okay, so this would be used if we are only allowed to take steps forward. For example, if we have the function defined, um, let's say, on an open interval from A to B, and we want to find the derivative at A, well, the function doesn't exist before A, so we can't do this central difference because it requires us to take a step backwards. But if we are already at the lower bound, we can't do that. So in that case, we would need to take the forward difference, okay? because we can look at values after the lower bound. Okay, so that's the forward difference. And lastly, there is the backwards difference. So in, um, in the other case where we are at the upper bound, we can't take any steps forward because we are at the upper bound. We can only take steps backwards. So in that case, we would use the second order backward difference. Okay, second order uh, backward difference. Okay, so again, we approximate the second order derivative as the difference between the first order derivatives. So we're going to take a step back. So that's going to be f of x minus f of x minus h. So that's a step backwards over h minus, and now we take another step back. So two steps back. So that's going to be f of x minus h minus f of x minus 2h all over h. And again, divide everything by the step size. Okay, we can simplify this. So this becomes f of x minus 2f of x minus h plus f of x minus 2h all over h squared. Okay, so just as a little example on where, we'd, where we would use these different uh, differences, um, like I said, if we had an open interval something like this from A to B with some function defined on it. If we are at the lower bound and we want to find the second order derivative, we can't take a step backwards because that doesn't exist. We can only take a step forward. So we would use the forward difference in this case. If we were at the upper bound, we can't take any steps forward because that doesn't exist. We can only take steps backwards. So here we, we would use the backward difference. But if we are in the middle, then we can use any three, um, any of the three, because we can take step forward, take step backwards. Um, that's not an issue. So we can use any of the methods. Yeah, and provided that H is small enough, um, any of these methods will be a good approximation to the second derivative. Okay, so there are a few exercises in the notes that you should try. So it is writing a Python program to implement these methods. So the first order difference, and then these three second order differences. Okay, we need to implement them uh, using a Python function. Yeah, and then there's a couple of examples of functions that you can um, you can use with your implementation. Okay, so this was numerical differentiation okay, using finite differences. We can use a similar method of 
taking a little finite piece uh, to approximate definite integrals. Okay, so let's have a look at that. And then we call this numerical integration. Okay, so very similar to the idea of differentiation, we start off with the exact definition for the integral. Um, in our case, we're going to be using the Riemann, the limit of a Riemann sum as the definite integral. So the integral from A to B, f of x dx, is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity, the sum from i equals 1 to n, f of x r delta x. Yeah, so um, you should have covered that um, last year. Okay, so remember this is exact if we take the limit, much like how we took the limit for the derivative. If we don't take the limit, then it becomes an approximation. So this is approximately equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n, f of x r delta x. Okay, so we remove the limit and it becomes an approximation. Okay, so this is one method using the Riemann sum to approximate the integral. There are various other methods um, that you can use to approximate an integral, uh, but we won't be getting into that. Okay, so maybe I will mention it later on um, in the tutorials, but you won't be tested on those other methods. Yeah, so there's something like the uh, trapezoidal rule, the Simpsons rule, Monte Carlo integration, and so on. Um, but we won't be uh, we won't be testing that. Yeah. yeah, maybe we can do an example in the tutorials though. Okay, so we're going to use this as our approximation. So how would we program this? Well, we need to be given a b and the function f, okay, as well as this value of n. Okay, so this n tells us um, how close to the limit we're going to get. So very, very large n will make this closer and closer to the exact value. Much like how in the derivative, very, very small h brought us closer to the exact value. Okay, so let's define the function f, for example. So def f of x, um, let's pick some sort of complicated function. So return x times x, or you could use x double star two, because that's for exponentiation. But let's just go with this, times np dot sine of x. Okay, so this corresponds to the function f of x equals x squared sine of x. Okay, and we would like to integrate this from some given a to some given b. So let's say a was zero. So in the program, you would have a equals zero. And let's say b is pi. So we can, again, use the numpy library to say np dot pi. That gives us our value of pi there. Okay, so we need to now figure out the sum over here. Now, the sum can be done using a for loop, because we just iterate over r and then add to the sum as we go along. So we need some, some, uh, uh, some variable. Let's start it off at 0, and then as we iterate over r, uh, we can add to this. Okay, next we need a value of n. Uh, we need a large value of n, so let's say 10,000 just to start off with. Okay, so we're going to iterate from i equals um, 1 to 10,000, or you can start from 0. Um, it doesn't matter. Okay, so as we have uh, more and more of these rectangles, uh, in the limits, it, it will approach the exact value. So we don't have to worry too much about the starting. Um, if you remember back to last year when you did the Riemann integral, that corresponds to the choice of sample point. So you can either choose the uh, right 
side of the rectangle, the left side, you can choose the middle of the rectangle or any arbitrary points inside. And if you take the limit, uh, that actually doesn't matter. Yeah, but for here, when we say take the limit, we mean choosing larger and larger values of n. Yeah, um, and then maybe we can test that out um, in the tutorial as well. Yeah, different values of n and different sample points to see what effect that has. Yeah, but let's start off uh, with i equals zero in this case. So we can have four i in range um, and then just n. So then this will go from zero up to n minus one. Yeah, so not including n. Yeah, so we need to determine xr. So xr is equal to um, the starting a plus r times and then delta x, but delta x is b minus a over n. So we can write that as b minus a over n, or you could define this as a separate delta x variable um, and then define it above. That's fine as well. Okay, so then we're going to have that the sum needs to be incremented by the function value evaluated at xr times delta x. So b minus a over n. Yeah, and then at the end, the sum will then approximate the integral. So we can print the value is and then the sum. Okay, so this is just a very, um, very approximate way of doing this. Yeah, of course, if we wanted a more precise answer, we would use a larger value of n. Now, there are a few optimizations that we can make. Okay, so I already mentioned one of them. This delta x over here, the b minus a over n, we see that we need to calculate this every single time we run uh, an iteration of the for loop. But this is a constant, so we shouldn't need to recalculate it every single time. So something uh, better to do would be to take this delta x and define it outside the for loop so that we don't need to do this subtraction and division each time. And we see that we're doing this twice here. So um, that's a bit excessive. Yeah, so we don't want to be calculating things uh, too many times. And um, that's one optimization we can do. Another thing is we can use the linearity of the sum to take this delta x outside, because the delta x doesn't depend on r. So what I mean by that is this over here is given by the sum um, i equals zero in this case to n minus one, f of x r delta x, but this delta x is a constant with respect to r, so we can actually take it out. So in fact, we can write this as delta x times, and then the sum from i equals zero to n minus one, f of x r. Okay, it just saves us doing this multiplication here um, on every iteration. We can only, um, instead we can do it once right at the end. Okay, so that's just a couple optimizations. You don't need to worry too much about that. Um, I will talk about optimizing your programs uh, later on. Okay, but it's just something to, to think about while you're doing these programs. All right, so there are a few exercises um, on this numerical integration in the notes and also in this week's tutorial. Okay, so please have a look at that. Uh, try out the tutorial. If you have any issues with it, please just email me or you can visit me in my office. Uh, the details are on the course webpage. Okay, so please, if you have any issues, please let me know. Okay, and then in the next lecture, we will take a look at uh, using this numerical integration to solve differential equations. So this might be your first time hearing about differential equations. 
So we're going to go through all the theory on differential equations, as well as this computational aspect. So you should have a full understanding um, when we're done with that. Okay, I'll see you next time.